What's going on guys? Out from Microgrinder Poker School here and in today's video we're going to talk about some exploitative adjustments that you can make to your poker game playing on these crazy, loose, and passive and somewhat sometimes aggressive global poker game. So let's go ahead and let's talk about that. Hey guys, welcome to today's video. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Alton Harden. I'm the founder of Microgrinder Poker School and this Tube 2 channel, and we're all about turning beginning and struggling poker players into solid winning poker players through sound poker fundamentals. So if you guys are new to this channel, consider hitting that subscribe button down there. And without further ado, let's go ahead and let's get into today's video where we're going to talk about making exploitative adjustments playing at these micro stakes games on globalpoker.com. So these games on Global Poker are a lot different than what a lot of you are used to playing online on the micro stakes, especially if you're coming from a site like America's Card Room or Black Chip Poker, where there's a lot more regs on the site. When you come over to America's Card Room, you have to make a lot of adjustments to your game to prevent yourself from spewing off chips. So when we're playing against a lot of regs, the way that we play and the style that we play should be different than the way that we play when we're playing against a lot of loose opponents. When I talk about loose opponents, we're typically talking about loose passive calling stations. And from the spectrum of thinking about players that are loose and passive, if we think about it, there's ones that play straightforward, fit or fold, and then there's the calling stations. But in general, they're all very loose pre-flop. So what I've noticed on these games at 4 and L and 10 and L and even up at 20 and L is that people are open limping. Tons of people are over limping. Lots of people are calling ISO raises and pre-flop raises. People are cold calling three bets and four bets, and they're getting the money in really light and typically really bad versus a player like me. So the style that we usually play when maybe there's one fish on the table and maybe two fish on the table and a bunch of other regs is going to be different than how we should be playing on these games. So what I want to talk about in today's video is talking about making some exploitative adjustments when you're faced with a lot of opponents that are really prone to calling bets pre-flop and post-flop and your fold equity on the table is very minimal and what we're going to talk about is adjusting your iso raising range and also um, developing an over limping range so a lot of people have been told in poker that limping is bad yes open limping is not a good thing but developing an over limping range is a good thing for those of you that play a lot of live and you play one two and one three you're going to be used to this. You're going to be used to a lot of open limping, so you're probably going to understand what I'm talking about. So let's go ahead and let's talk about it. Um, I have some tables open in the background so you guys can kind of see what's going on and see how much um, limps there are and over limps and ISO raises, three bets, pre-flop raises, and all that stuff as well in the background while we talk about this. But let's talk about developing an ISO raising range. And so for example, here's a limp, here's an ISO range. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets called by at least one person. Um, when I first started the video, this ended up being, I think, a family pot of all limpers. So I mean, um, I'm seeing exactly what I'm used to seeing on this site. And there you go, this guy calls, this guy calls. So what happens with our ISO raising range when our fold equity goes down? and we have to make hands that actually can win at showdown. What should we be doing? And what should we be doing if multiple people are gonna be open limping? For example, I wouldn't be surprised if at least one other person on this table over limps, and this goes multi-ways. Um, so the question is, well, how do we adjust? And there you go, here's a four-way limp pot. How do we adjust our ranges for a very loose passive style of tables? Well, in general, a, a lot of us has been told is that we should ISO raise the fish really wide where we have an equity edge. Yeah, typically we should. Um, but when we're facing opponents that don't respect ISO races and fold equity really just goes out the door into the garbage can, we need to actually ISO raise with hands that can win at showdown. So when we're talking about that, we're talking about high equity hands, hands that retain their equity well, hands that can make a good top pair, like top pair of aces, top pair of kings, or top pair of queens. And even in a multi-way pot, 
against two or three or four opponents, they'll often win with top pair. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, there are speculative hands. These are hands that even if they flop a pair, it's not going to be a good pair. So like a small pocket pair, a suited connector, suited two gapper, um, weaker broadways, a suited aces, um, off-suited connectors, off-suited one gappers, all those hands. Those are more speculative hands. And, and so when we think about those two different type of hands, we want to be iso-raising a very conservative premium style of hand that has a lot of equity. And so I'm going to show you a very conservative, a very conservative ISO raising range against tables like these. Of course, we're going to have our standard hands that we're going to ISO raise. Um, but then we're going to have some hands that, that are medium strength hands and some of them that actually might be hands we might want to overlimp. So here's an example of a very conservative ISO raising range. And I guess we can put ace jack off in there. Um, and I think this is probably going to be a style of a range that you're going to want to default to ISO raising here at 4 and L. And you may even want to short up a little bit and maybe even take 8s out of there in certain situations and take 9s out of there in certain situations. And even king, queen, suit, and ace, jack off in certain situations. So against a single opponent, having a range like this is fine, especially if you don't think other players are going to come along. But let's say that's under the gun open limps, you ISO raise in middle position, and then you think that cut off and button or cut off or button and one of the blinds are going to come along, come along as well. Well, now you're playing a multi-way pot. So your ISO raise really didn't do the job of isolating, isolating that one fish. So if you think that more people are going to come along, which is typically what's going to happen on these tables, is that we want to even tighten it up a little bit more when we're ISO raising. Or we want to increase our ISO raise sizing. So our standard three big blinds plus one big blind per limper goes out the door as well. If we want to maximize fold equity, then maybe we should make it five big blinds or even six or seven big blinds to isolate that one limper. So we can either tighten up a range or we can increase our bet sizing to maximize fold equity. Um, against multiple, oppo multiple opponents, we're probably going to want to stick to a range like this. Um, so if there's three limpers in the pot, we want high equity hands like these to ISO raise them. Now, it's entirely different strategy if we're playing weak tight opponents. So some of these tables, you're going to face some opponents that open limp, and then they fold to a lot of ISO raises. Not all these tables are full of weak, loose, passive opponents. I would say 90% of them are, but I've been on some tables where there's several weak tight opponents that are open limping and folding to an ISO raise. If that's the case, and like I said, this is going to be an exception to the rule. Majority of them are going to be loose passive. But if that's the case, then we can ISO raise a much wider range because we expect them to play fit or fold, and we expect them to fold a lot to our ISO raises. So I'm just going to go ahead and add in a lot of different hands just because we don't need hands that are going to win a showdown, but we have a lot of hands where we can fire a continuation bet on the flop or we expect them to fold pre-flop. So against weak tight opponents that are overfolding, over we can increase our ISO raise sizing. Um, against the other opponents on the flip side, the ones that are never folding, we need high equity hands. So that's how we kind of tweak our ISO raising range. Um, in terms of sizing, when you have the top of the top of your range, and let's just do this as an example, right, are very strong hands, tens plus, ace, queen plus. You want to exploitatively bump up your ISO raising sizing. So even against one opponent, if they're going to call an 8x ISO raise versus a 4x, I'll make it 8x. If there's three different opponents and we're in position, so standard sizing would three, be three big blinds plus one per limper, it would be six big blinds. Um, typically, I am really bumping up my sizing. So I may might even make it 10 or 11 big blinds and people are still going to call on this side. So with the top end of our range, we want to increase our sizing more. And because we're really only going to be ISO raising them with high equity hands, we want to bump up the sizing in general, regardless of any of these hands that we're raising. Now, that's ISO raising. So fairly straightforward, fairly simple. Just tighten up your game, bump up your sizing, ISO raise with high equity hands because you expect to go multi-ways and you need hands that are going to win at showdown a lot. Now let's talk about, well, what happens if you get a hand like one of, of these hands? And let's just put together some speculative hands in here in our range. 
and let's put some suited one gappers let's put some weaker suited aces we'll even go up to ace eight or ace nine uh, maybe some weaker kings and weaker queens as well so a range like this um, i think this is a fairly wide range of speculative hands right we have small to medium pocket pairs that are really our set mining hands we have our suited connectors our off suited connectors our suited one gappers um, we have some weaker kings and aces and queens and suited aces that can make straights and flushes and two pair and sets. So that really all these hands here are going to make straights, flushes, two pairs and sets. Yes, our aces can make top pair, but when we make top pair, we're not really happy because our kicker isn't that great. And same thing with king nine, queen nine, jack nine. Yes, they can make top pair, but sometimes we're going to be out kicked because a lot of these loose passive opponents are limping a fairly strong range that include hands like king 10, king jack, king queen, ace jack, ace 10 that are going to dominate these. So when we have hands like these, how do we make adjustments on tables like these where people are over limping a lot, people are calling ice raises really wide and people are cold calling ice raises. What do we do when we wake up, wake up with a hand like this? Well, we need to develop a fairly wide over limping range. And again, those of you that play live poker, you're going to see this a lot, lots of people open limp and over limp. It's a part of the game. Um, we don't want to, so here's again, I mean, we have an open limper. This one went three-way limped hand, a preflop. Uh, let's see how far this one goes. Just kind of pay attention. And, and so the question is, should we be ISO raising speculative hands if we don't expect to have decent fold equity? And the answer is typically no, we shouldn't. So instead, on these passive tables where there's not an aggress a lot of aggressive ISO raisers left behind, there's not a lot of aggressive uh, three bet squeezers behind us, uh, where a majority of the players are fun recreational players that are loose passive or weak tight passive, then we should really be developing a very, very wide overlimping range. And this is really great for us because we're not going to get exploited. I mean, look at this guy. This guy ISO raises. He's going to call. I can almost guarantee this guy calls like 90% of the time. Um, it, it's just, you know, and, and again here, another ISO raise, and I guarantee at least one of their opponents going to call on this ISO raise as well. And so there we go. Um, three ways, an ISO raise. So rather than ISO raise a hand like pocket fives or pocket sevens, where a lot of the the boards, a lot of the flops are going to be bad for us where there's going to be over cards and post flop we don't have much fold equity. And same thing for a lot of these weaker hands that rely on straights and flushes and two pairs and really strong draws. And a lot of our weaker top pairs where our kicker is not that great, but we can make really strong flushes and some really strong straights. We should develop an overlimping range instead because we're risking a lot less pre-flop to see the flop to try to see a flop against several fishy opponents where we expect to have a huge, huge advantage post-flop in terms of our skill advantage over them. Um, and this is a good example here. This guy had Jack Queen. This guy had Ace-10. Um, I believe there was an ISO raise. I forgot who ISO raised, but um, I believe it might have been one of these opponents, but he ended up calling it off with middle pair. And I saw raise pot, and there was multiple raises. Here's another example: Ace Jack versus Eight Queen versus Pocket Fours, um, and sets end up taking it down. But what this shows us is that ranges are really wide. Sometimes people are going to have decent hands within their limping and over limping and and, and flat calling range. Um, other times they're going to have really strong hands. I've seen people over limp open lamp, call ISO raises, not three bet with aces, kings, and queens um, here at four and L and ten and L. In the small amount of time that I've been on here, I would say probably like at least five or six times, and I haven't played that many hands, more than I've, I've seen it on Ignition in probably like three or four months. So we have to be careful of our ISO raising range, and we don't want to ISO range too wide. And instead, we should be overlimping a range like this to try to see a flop for as cheap as possible. Because remember, it's all about risk and reward. If we can risk one big blind with a speculative hand to try to see a flop with a hand that plays very well multi-ways against several opponents that are very bad, then why shouldn't we? It doesn't make sense to ISO raise, let's say, pocket fours or eight seven suited or a six suited to 6BB pre-flop and get called by two or three opponents, go to flop, not see a very good flop, have a fish donk bed into us, and have to check fold. 
because we're risking six big blinds to see a flop against multiple opponents with the speculative hand when we can only risk one big blind. So I know this is a bit counterintuitive because a lot of people are, are tell us and ingrain into our brain that limping is bad. Limping is bad. Yeah, it's bad. But when you're on some funky tables like this where um, you don't see this type of play in, in standard six max games online, we have to tweak our game to fit these games. So yeah, so those are really two of the biggest adjustments. Um, another adjustment is is tighten up your, your open raising range as well in early and middle position because, again, you're going to get multiple calls. So, again, you're going to want to have higher equity hands. When you get to late position, um, it really depends on who's in, in the blinds and how they play post-flop. But a lot of the major adjustments go to ISO raising and over limping and our sizings that, that really um, modify... Uh, value with ISO raising range because we're ISO raising in a lot stronger hands. We want to bump up our ISO raising range really big. Same thing for three betting and four betting as well. I mean, bump it up. People are going to call. So that's going to conclude today's video. If you guys liked it, please give it a thumbs up. If you guys haven't checked out my Patreon account, and if you guys like all the free videos that I do here on YouTube, please check out my Patreon account down in the description because you guys can help support the free videos here on YouTube and keep them coming on a regular basis. You can support this channel for as little as $1 per month. And if you guys aren't subscribed to my channel, please hit that subscription button down on the bottom corner. And again, guys, thanks for watching my video. Leave comments below. What do you guys think about these exploitative adjustments I'm talking about? What exploitative adjustments have you guys actually made yourself? What do you found to be good? What have you found to be bad? Um, you know, what's the most profitable strategy you found at 4NL, 10NL, and 20NL on Global Poker? Post it all down below. Let us know. Thanks for watching, guys. Been out with Microgrinder Poker School, and I'll see you guys at the next video. Take care.